Thanks, we appreciate it. <clears throat> you know, as Marion was telling the children the story, I could just see God, you know, looking for us. I'm so grateful that uh, he found me and uh, I turned around at the right time and, and responded. I, uh, life's been so much a blessing since. That was uh, 1985. My well, message today, for some reason, kind of introduces the lesson for next week. I found out uh, yesterday, I realised, when I was looking through my lesson. I wanted to talk about the church. And just by way of introduction, let me read to you. You can read it yourself. What we, our kind of doctrinal statement, what our church says about the church. Uh, we don't have a creed as some churches, but we do have a list of sort of doctrines that we agree, agree on. The church is the community of believers who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. In continuity with the people of God in Old Testament times, we are called out from the world and we join together for worship, for fellowship, for instruction in the Word, for the celebration of the Lord's Supper, for service to all mankind. Is it my fault? Service to all mankind. And for the worldwide proclamation of the gospel. The church derives its authority from Christ who is the incarnate word, and from the scriptures, which are the written word, the church is God's family. Its members live on the basis of the new covenant. The church is the body of Christ, a community of faith, of which Jesus Christ himself is the head. The church is the bride for whom Christ died, that he might sanctify and cleanse her. At his return and triumph, he will present her to himself, a glorious church. Hang on, I need to go to there. A glorious church, sorry, the faithful of all ages, the purchase of his blood, not having spot or wrinkle, but holy and without blemish. And there's quite a list of passages from scripture. But the next doctrine is this one. You know, that's a good statement, isn't it? I agree with that. The next belief we have is a remnant. The universal church is composed of all who truly believe in Christ, but in the last days, a time of widespread apostasy, a remnant, remnant has been called out to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This remnant announces the arrival of the judgment hour, proclaims salvation through Christ, and heralds the approach of his second advent. This proclamation is symbolized by the three angels of Revelation 14. It coincides with the work of judgment in heaven and results in a work of repentance and reform on earth. Every believer is called to have a personal part in the worldwide witness. And this amazing passage from uh, Paul in Ephesians 3, if you'd like to turn to it. Ephesians 3, 10 to 12. His intent, this is God's, was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him and through faith in him we may approach God with freedom and confidence. We thought the purpose of the church was to reach the world with good news, eh? It's much bigger than that, isn't it? God is trying to demonstrate something to the whole universe to authorities in the heavenly realms and uh, I think we need to lift our sights. When Jesus ascended, he left behind a body of flesh and blood. Have you thought about that? That's you and me. Scripture calls that body the church and says that Christ is the head. And you can read all about the church in the, in the book of Acts, how it developed, how God added to the church every day. And all the churches that developed. In fact, you know, if you look at Revelation 1, it, took, it pictures Jesus standing amongst the seven golden candlesticks, doesn't it? Golden candlesticks? That's actually a seven-branched candlestick, right? 
candlestick, that, what they call a menorah. All those seven churches are all in one. They're not all different denominations. You think about that for a minute. They're all one lampstand. But let's see how we got started. How did Jesus get started? Matthew 16. Matthew 16. Have I got that up there? Matthew 16, 16. To 18. You know the story. Jesus was uh, having a bit of a talk to the disciples. And uh, he came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, verse 13 of chapter 16. And he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? They said, well, some say he's the John the Baptist. Others say he's Elijah. Still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? Jesus said, who do you say I am? <coughs> the big question. Simon Peter answered, Peter answered for all of them, but you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man. You didn't think this up, but my father in heaven, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell will not overcome it. When, when Peter said, you are the Christ, that was a huge deal. We don't think much of it. But for a Jewish person to say to Jesus, you are the Messiah, that was a huge step forward. And what did Jesus say? Now I can build. On this confession, not on Peter, on this confession, he can build a church. When every one of us accepts Jesus is my Messiah, he can build a church. Sorry, I'm jumping again. There's two gates. One of them you find in Matthew there. He said, I'll give you, what did he say? I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He said, the gates of hell will not overcome it. Revelation 1, he said, uh, 10 I think it is, he says, well I can't read my own writing, I think it's 10 or 18, hell and death, the gates of hell and death, right? Jesus has, Jesus has the key to the gates of hell and death. He said he'll give to Peter, the disciples, the apostles, the keys of the kingdom. He has the keys to hell and death. Genesis 28, if you'd like to turn there. Genesis 28, 17. This is a story of Jacob. Remember when he was running? He was running because of his own... Uh, because of his own mistakes. And he laid down to sleep. Genesis 28, and let's have a look at verse 17. He woke up from his sleep and he'd seen that dream, you remember? The ladder. He said, Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed. Sorry, I'm going to jump. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than what? The house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Isn't that an interesting statement? The house of God is the gate of heaven. Now that's a solemn responsibility, isn't it? Paul in 1 Timothy 3.15 called the church something else. 1 Timothy Three fifteen. What did Paul call it? First Timothy three fifteen. He 
You want me to look it up? <laughs> the pillar and ground of truth. Didn't he say that? The church is the pillar, the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth or the ground of truth. Wow. So when we get to the New Testament, the end times, there seems to be two, not 34,000 like they'll tell you. There's 34,000 different denominations in this world, but the Bible only talks about two churches, doesn't it? Even from Genesis, right from Genesis, I've discovered as I was studying, the Bible is full of contrasts. Two trees in the middle of the garden, wasn't there? The tree of life and the tree of knowledge. The tree of knowledge of good and evil. They were both together in the middle. So when Adam and Eve came to the tree of life, they had to consciously not go to the tree of knowledge. In Revelation 12, I want to, I want to spend most of our time in Revelation 12, you see... Two women. Women always represent a church in prophecy. Uh, this pure woman in Revelation 12. This mother of harlots, it says in, in Revelation 17. There's two cities. Galatians 4.26. Our mother is the New Jerusalem. In Revelation 17.5, the mother of harlots. So the Bible contrasts life and death, darkness and light, good and evil, all the way through, doesn't it? Faith and unbelief, sin and righteousness, Christ and Satan, heaven and hell, lost and found. There's numerous truth and error. I discover this uh, amazing contrast in the Bible. Saturday versus Sunday. So when we, we believe is... Uh, Significant in the last days. The patience of the saints. And no rest for the wicked. Interesting, isn't it? Also, the Bible is full of parallels. In the Old Testament in Genesis there, God created woman out of man. In the New Testament, God created the church out of Christ. I think I've got that on there, haven't I? In, in Genesis, the woman was deceived by the serpent. In, in Revelation 12, the dragon waiting to devour her child. In, in Genesis, the woman gives birth to man, a son. In Revelation 12, the woman gives birth to a man-child. In Genesis, the man rules over the woman. In, in, in Revelation, Christ is the head of the church. Adam and Eve were clothed with light. You get that from the spirit of prophecy. And they must have been clothed with something because they realized they were naked, right? And in Revelation, the woman is clothed with the sun. It's like the light that they lost is restored. And God promised enmity between the woman, woman's seed and the serpent seed. And in Revelation 12, we see the dragon is wrath of the woman. And we'll be talking probably next week a lot more in Sabbath School about these, some of these other analogies. The bride of Christ. Christ is the husband. She, uh, he said, you are his temple. He's the cornerstone and the builder. You are the body of Christ. He's the head. You are the family of God in heaven and earth. And he called us his flock. I don't know whether that offends you, but uh, we are a lot like sheep. We're the branches, he's the vine. A kingdom of priests, he said. So, I'll, come, I'll go into this a little bit further. Exodus 19. He started off with uh, Israel, didn't he? Exodus 19, verse 3. Exodus 19, verse 3 to 8. Then Moses went up to God and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, 
then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together. Everything the Lord says, we will do. So Moses brought the answer back to the Lord. That was the weakness of the old covenant, wasn't it? The people's were the weakness. So God says they were a peculiar treasure. Is that what it says there? A kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Now they had an option, they had choices, right? What do we do with this special privileged position? We could build a big wall around ourselves so that no one else could touch us and contaminate us. That's what they did, isn't it? Fortress Israel, keep out. But what is a kingdom? What is a kingdom? A kingdom has subjects. And the king is supreme ruler. And everyone in the kingdom is his subject. So he makes the rules. And when you understand what God is like, he isn't like building a wall around himself and uh, keeping it to himself, is he? What do priests do? Priests have always interceded on behalf of sinful people with God. Mediators between God and man. This was the purpose God intended for Israel. A holy nation, what would that look like? Set apart, you know, set apart for a holy purpose. Holy. Jesus said we're the salt of the earth. We're supposed to make everyone's lives more tasty. More palatable. He said we're lights on a hill. So the New Testament church, you know, is clothed with the sun. So how did we get down to where we are today? I, I wanted to have a look at some prophecies. Enoch was the first prophet in the Bible. And did you know he predicted the flood? If you have a look at his name, the name he gave to his son. Who is that? Genesis 5. Did we write it down? But what was the name he gave to his son? Enoch, Joy, you'll know. Methuselah. What does Methuselah mean? Anyone know? Yes, it's an amazing statement. When he, I've had different interpretations. When he dies, it shall be. Well, when he is dead, it shall be sent. And it's possible that Noah understood this to mean the flood, some world crisis is going to happen when Methuselah dies. And if you do your maths in Genesis, you'll find that's exactly what happened. But we, I've noticed something in prophecy. A prophet makes a prophecy, a prediction, just before it's about to be fulfilled, God raises another prophet to organize a remnant to preach the warning message, right? So just before the flood, God raises up Noah. It's, I believe Noah understood Methuselah's, the meaning of Methuselah's name and that it was a prophecy. I can't prove that. But he organized the remnant, didn't he? How many were there? Only eight. Yes. A remnant who kept the commandments of God, it says Noah was blameless. They had the faith of Jesus. They would have to have the faith of Jesus to go into a boat when it had never rained and it was built on dry land. And they had the spirit of prophecy. Noah was a prophet. So they came out of the crisis. Abraham was a prophet. 
God prophesied through Abraham that Israel would be in bondage for 430 years. And I, I, I looked this up last night. The prophecy in Genesis 15 says 400 years, isn't it? But the first time God gave Abraham this prophecy was in Genesis 12. And Abraham was 30 years old, or younger then. So his original prophecy adds up to 430 years. But when he, he was 75 at the time. So when he turned 105, that's when God gave him the prophecy of 400 years. And what happened at the end of 430 years? God raised up who? Exodus 12. Just before the end of the prophecy, Exodus 12, verse 40 and 41. Verse 40 and 41. Now the length of the time the Israelite people lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of the 430 years to the very day, all the Lord's divisions left Egypt. To the very day. So the time prophecy was accurate and they came out of Egypt. Moses organized the remnant. One of the issues that came up there was the Sabbath. They were working seven days a week as slaves, weren't they? And one of the reasons Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh is because they needed to go and worship God. They wanted to be obedient to his commandments. They had to have the faith of Jesus to apply the blood to their doorposts and they definitely had the spirit of prophecy represented in Moses those who left Egypt were the remnant in 25 chapter 25 of Jeremiah he prophesied that Israel would be under Babylonian captivity for how many years 70 70 years Near the end of that uh, 70 years, God raised up three prophets. Daniel, Haggai and Zechariah all spoke in those, uh, towards the end of those 70 years. We think for 538 when Daniel spoke that it was time to go and rebuild Jerusalem. <coughs> and they all helped organise a remnant to go. In fact, Haggai said, it is time. So the remnant went, if you look in the first chapter of Haggai, the remnant went to build. They were obedient to the commandment. They had faith of Jesus and they had the prophecy, spirit of prophecy. Daniel, further down, prophesied 70 weeks in chapter 9. 70 weeks, two prophecies I want to look at of Daniel's. In chapter 8, he prophesied 2,300 years. In Daniel 9, he prophesied 70 weeks of years. So that's 490 years have been determined on your people. And he said, from the going forth, he gives the detail, from the going forth of this, this uh, announcement, uh, decree to rebuild Jerusalem, then we measure from there, 490 years. And it's been studied for centuries, and it's accurate. There's been some debate over the years about the, the, the date of that decree, 457. We've always said it's 457. And some people questioned it, 457 BC, when that decree went out. But it's, uh, the more they've studied it, the more solid it's become. I read about the elephantine papyri this, uh, in the last week, which was a whole lot of papers, invoices, and stuff that was uh, found years ago from that era that somebody, you know, the archaeologists thought this is nothing, so they put it aside. But somebody kept them stored, and as they started to go through them, they found out what do you find on invoices? Dates. <laughs> the dates. The date 457 BC for that decree is exact. 20, uh, how many weeks was it? 62 weeks. 
Seven weeks, 62 weeks, and one week. The Messiah came right on time, exactly when it said. He was cut off exactly when it said, in the midst of the last week. And what happened at the end of the last week, when the, when the 490 years were finished, marked by the stoning of Stephen, the gospel was taken away from the Jewish people and spread to the Gentiles. And as you read the book of Acts, you see it happening. Someone was raised up just before the end of that prophecy, John the Baptist. He applied, applied it to his generation. Behold the Lamb of God, he said, exactly as the prophecy had predicted, who takes away the sin of the world. So a remnant came out of Judaism to form the new church. Obedient to God must have been hard must have been terribly hard for them. I try and imagine what it was like for the chosen people to admit we were we are now not the chosen anymore. We have to come out. That'll be a challenge. They were guided by the spirit of prophecy. Some of these people wrote the New Testament. You know, and also we know of Malachi predicted, didn't he? Elijah coming. Just no time prophecy really but he did say before the great and terrible day God will raise up a prophet so Daniel prophesied in, in chapter 8 2,300 years and then the sanctuary be cleansed so when the start date's the same but it takes you way down beyond scripture to 1844 and this, there seems to be no prophecies of time after that. John, from Revelation, in Revelation, applies it to end times. So, let's have a look, would you? Revelation 10. Then I saw another, I was standing at the beginning, then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll, a little book it says, eh, doesn't it, in the King James, which lay open in his hand. He planted his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the, hand, on the land and he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. When he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, Seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. Then the angel I had seen standing in the sea and on the land raised his hand, right hand to heaven. And he swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it, and said, There will be no more delay. I like what the King James says, there will be time no longer. But in the days when the seventh angel, seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more, Go take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who is standing in the sea and the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, Take it and eat it. It will turn... Turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned sour. It's another contrast. Then I was told, you must prophesy again about many people's nations, languages and kings. So when we leave Daniel, the book's... The book is uh, closed, isn't it? Sealed up. But when we get to Revelation, we find this little book open. And uh, so we're looking for a remnant appearing around about 1844, right? There must be someone turning up here. If all these prophecies, time prophecies, work the way I said, God must raise someone up just before the prophecy who keep the commandments, 
who have faith in Jesus and who have the spirit of prophecy. And they must organise the remnant. We don't really have to guess because we, I don't know if you know your history, some of you may not, the greatest revival that ever happened in modern times was the revival that happened just before 1844. When the people believed, we trace our ancestry to these people, the Millerites, who believed that Jesus was coming back because they understood that the sanctuary, the cleansing of the sanctuary was the cleansing of the earth. That was a mistake. But their timing was great. They had their timing correct. But it wasn't the end of the world. They'd sold their farms. They'd got ready for Jesus to return. They worked out exactly the day, October the 22nd. And he never came. So if you Google the great disappointment, you'll find out about the history of our church. Not really our church. Our church didn't start till the 1860s. But these are the people we trace our heritage to. We're not ashamed of the great disappointment because the Bible predicted it. Revelation 10, he said, you'll, you'll understand this little book. You'll eat it, digest it, and you'll get excited because it's so tasty. And what will happen when you swallow it? Turn sour. That's exactly what happened, isn't it? This is this is a this is how where we trace our ancestry. Now, about this time, about the 1840s, there's lots of contenders to fit this remnant, right? Joseph Smith appears. Charles Russell appears. Watchtower Society. Mary Baker Eddy appears. Christian Science. Christadelphians appear. John Thomas. The Fox sisters appear. Spiritualism, a lot of these people are all in the same area even. You know, even in New Zealand, the Ringatu appear. You know what the seal of the Ringatu people is? The law of God and the truth of Jesus. They're Maori, it's a Maori tribe who keep the Sabbath. But are they interested in prophecy? Do they have the gift of prophecy? Are they interested in 2,300 days? I haven't seen that. And so, really, you're down to one. <laughs> and that's why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I believe this is the remnant. But this huge disappointment, you know, almost destroyed these people. But some of them said, no. We know this was God from God. You know, we could tell when we were studying. And, the, and when the light came, we knew God was in this. So we need to get back and study our Bibles again and find out where we went wrong. And you, what do you see? Two men walking across a field. One was called, we only have the name of one, Hiram Edson. And he suddenly stopped in the middle of the field and this kind of had a vision. He doesn't really say that, but he suddenly saw their mistake. That, that Jesus hadn't, wasn't going to come to the earth he was going to change, his ministry was going to go from the holy place to the most holy in heaven, the sanctuary in heaven. And uh, so they got together and studied it again. And, and uh, it's, I find that so fascinating because you know the great disappointment that happened in, in the Bible when Jesus didn't turn out to be the deliverer they thought they were going to have. Two men were walking along a road, completely broken-hearted. What happened? We only have one of their names, Cleopas. Jesus came along. He didn't identify himself. He gave them a Bible study. And everything changed, right? From that day forward, the church has had this power to, to lead people to Jesus because they know that the church is a prophetic movement. Why would a person stand up and face a lion rather than renounce his faith? It has to be based on more than just sentimentalism, right? It's based on prophecy. The Bible proved that this movement is true. We know Jesus rose from the dead and he can raise me from the dead. 
So what is the what was the uh, what was the message for this movement? Let's have a look at Revelation 11. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshippers there, but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months. I will give power to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days. The temple, they went back and studied the sanctuary. The two witnesses are the Old Testament and the New Testament. It must be Bible based. So these people got together, a small remnant. They must have been mocked quite a lot by the people around who said, you guys were completely wrong. What do you see when this little group, someone says, look, you people want to be Bible based. Why aren't you keeping Saturday? Sunday's not the Sabbath. So they studied it and accepted it. Someone else said, the Bible says we should wash each other's feet. Why don't you do it? Oh, yes, okay, so accepted that. Someone else said, the Bible teaches that you go and eat pork. Why do you eat pork? Studied it, accepted it. And you see this gift of prophecy arriving. <laughs> This gift of prophecy arriving in the group. This young lady, she's only 17, 18 years old. And started having visions. I don't know what that would be like, young ladies. <laughs> It'd be pretty terrifying, I think. And then having the courage to bring it to the group and say, you know, I think God's talking to me. You know, he, he brought it to two other guys as well, but they didn't. One of them ran away from it, and one of them did work with the, with the message uh, William Foy but Hazen Foss ran away and when he, he was at the, at the meeting when Ellen White said I think God's talking to me and, he, and she related the vision, what did Hazen Foss say? God gave me that vision but I ran away so to me the evidence is quite clear the remnant, I like to say the church of the remnant that the Bible talks about is the seventh day Adventist church. They keep the commandments, have the faith of Jesus, have the spirit of prophecy. But it says there in Revelation 12 that the dragon's wrath, the last verse, the dragon is enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the remnant of her seed who obey the commandments and hold the testimony of Jesus. Have you noticed any war going on? <laughs> You don't really feel like I'm in a war zone, do you? But this war is a war of ideas, isn't it? You will find the devil's angry with this movement. Our doctrines have been attacked. Our practices have been attacked. You know, the marriage and the family. The Sabbath's been attacked. The sanctuary doctrines have been attacked. Even the prophetic gifts have been attacked. Now the structure, you know, we've been arguing about ordination. The institutions are struggling. Our schools are struggling. We live behind enemy lines. But our purpose is to call out people out of Babylon. There's two women in Revelation. One's pure and one is a prostitute. And Jesus said, you are a kingdom of priests. It's even in the New Testament, isn't it? So our full-time job really is interceding for other people. Living our lives for God. Should we keep this to ourselves? Build a wall around ourselves? Keep people out? I don't believe so. I was thinking about Laodicea. There's a description. I'll read it to you. Revelation 3. The last church, isn't it? These churches in the beginning of Revelation are all phases of God's church in history. The last church we believe, that's us. Revelation 3, verse 14. To the angel of the church and laid us here right. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. 
I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. You know? One of the things about becoming a Christian is to be truthful, isn't it? We need to come. One of the first things that are required, like, like, Jesus, like Peter said to Jesus, you are the Messiah. We need to speak the truth. We need to say, I am a sinner. You are the Messiah. We need to be truthful about our condition. Here's, here's the last church. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Doesn't sound too good. <laughs> it's quite challenging, isn't it? Thankfully, we're honest, apparently. We don't realise we're like this. But I think he wants us to know those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Thank God. His message is because he loves us. <laughs> so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We were discussing that in Sabbath school this morning. One of the secrets of success in the Christian life is not to say, I am a really nice person. Right? Realising your great need. And God can actually work with you. The, things, the good things that you do are only his doing, aren't they? So yeah, I think it applies to the church as a whole. We need to be honest. So yeah, that was uh, my message for you today. And I wanted to encourage you to uh, share the good thing you have. We are a little bit shy. We're a little bit kind of naive. But we do have the message that the world needs to hear. So don't be shy. I've chosen for the last song, uh, Marching Design. I don't know whether they would sing this hymn in Baghdad, but I'd like to sing it with you. Come we that love the Lord.
Let's pray. Father, we do uh, realise <coughs> sometimes that our legacy is mostly failure and we are <coughs> not adequate to do the, the mission that you've asked us to do, but we have come to know that you are faithful, that when we put ourselves out to do what you want, you work through us. <coughs> so make us faithful, make us truthful, and uh, may we be a blessing this new week to the people around us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.